ACOs, Accountable Care Organizations, and it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists this morning. I'm going to start with Dr. Anjali Vias. Uh, she is the Chief Executive Officer of FPG Healthcare. It's an ACO under the CMS Shared Savings Program. She's a board-certified physician in internal medicine. Dr. Vias received her medical degree from, and I might get this wrong, Meharry Medical College uh, in 2008 with high honors. She completed her internal medicine residency training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Um, she is a member of the American Medical Association, American associate member American College of Physicians and Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Welcome, Dr. Vias. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Dr. Khalid Moidu, welcome. Uh, Dr. Moidu is the CIO at Family Physicians Group of Florida. He is a medical graduate and has a doctorate in medical informatics from the Linkping University. I almost, when I was reading this last night, said LinkedIn University. That's how much I'm into the things, but that's in Sweden. Uh, he has extensive experience in informatics from managing operations to academia, policy development, and entrepreneurship. He was the professor and program director for healthcare informatics at George Mason University from 2007 to 2010, and earlier he taught health informatics at other academic centers. Welcome, Dr. Moidu. Uh, many of you have known Eric uh, Lutemeyer uh, for some time. He's been a regular visitor here. He's also a seasoned operations and financial executive with a proven history of strong leadership and reputation for affecting business turnarounds. Throughout his career, he's exemplified a principled leadership style with a focus on operational success and financial controls. As president of Growth Plan Strategies, he's contracted in a consultative capacity for one of the original accountable care organizations organizations approved by CMS as part of the Pioneer program. Uh, as well, Eric uh, began his career with Health South Corp, a multi-billion dollar international medical corporation. During his time with Health South, the company grew from 56 locations to over 3,000 worldwide in a six-year span. That sounds exhausting. Uh, Eric, you've got experience with MSOs, MSAs, IPAs, ACOs, and a bunch of other acronyms, I'm sure. Welcome, Eric. And another uh, fine friend and, and past speaker for us, Ken Peach. Ken's the executive director of the Health Council of East Central Florida, which is our health planning agency for Orlando and the Space Coast. Uh, before joining health the Health Council in December of 2010, he ran a medical practice business development company and health insurance agency. And for 20 years, from 85 to 2005, he was an administrator in hospitals, health systems, senior living facilities. For two years, he was the American Hospital Association Regional Executive for Florida and Puerto Rico, and Vice President Integrated Delivery Systems with the Florida Hospital Association. Ken holds a BA in communications from, um, from Seton Hall University, an MBA with Health Service Administration degree from the Florida Institute of Technology. He's a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives, and we're so glad you're here with us again today, Ken, Ken Peach. Uh, before you leave today, throughout the program, you'll see that we have some comment and request cards. The uh, presentations that we put on each month, with whether it's an individual speaker or a panelist, are done based on your comments. So, uh, of course, we want to know whether you like today's presentation, the food, and all of these other things, but we'd like your ideas on what future programs you may like to see here at More Of. You want more of that? We're going to give it to you. All right. Yeah, come on. We've got to throw a little one in there every now and then. <clears throat> All right, so today's presentation, Accountable Care Organizations, I'm going to throw out a few words that you're going to hear today. I'm putting them out early so you can uh, think about them and how they're going to impact your organization. You're going to hear about things such as trials of care, high utilizers, engagement, whether that be physician engagement, patient engagement. You're going to hear about shared information responses. You're going to hear pros and cons, so keep an open mind. And you'll hear things about social entitlement, broken systems, and hopefully fixed systems. 
So we'll start right off with our program today. Dr. Moy Du, will you get us started on accountable care organizations? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It looks like everybody has had a good dose of coffee, so it's great. It's with great pleasure I have the honor of asking Dr. Anjali to first present the concept of the ACO and then our own FPG healthcare experiences. And then I'll give a little story on information technology that is very foundational to all these activities. And it will be followed by Eric, who will give us the other side of the story as he manages them. And finally, Ken will give us the picture as we see it in, in the coastline in, in eastern central Florida. So with that said and done, Dr. Anjali, please. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? I have the makeshift one. <laughs> so if you can't hear me, just let me know. We'll try and go quickly, because I know there's different entities from different origins that are going to come in here. And we want to keep things interactive and talk about what you're interested in. But we'll start with the basics, so we're all on the same page about theory. And just to give you a little background, um, our FPG Healthcare ACO was approved from last year. So July was our start date. We're on a track one shared savings program. And we'll just start with the basics. How about that? And please feel free to ask questions. Okay. So really the basics. What is an ACO? So I'd like to go through a broad definition and kind of highlight the points that we should really think about when we're thinking about accountable care organizations. And so I really like this quote. So by definition, it's an integrated healthcare delivery system that contracts to provide a full continuum. And I think continuum is a an, very important word, of services to a defined patient population. There is specific reimbursement, that's including financial, with incentives that establish to meet both quality and expense targets. So they really are making it a bundled, and we've seen this in the past, where they want to take a defined population, but also define how you utilize and how you treat that population to be effective in quality, but also cost efficient. So for many that are coming here from offices and you're doing this day in and day out, why, maybe you've asked yourself the question, why even change? We've been doing this for so long. Why are we even changing our current system to, what's, what's the reason? And so we've heard this story a lot, but starting with the basics again, I think you can see there's just, even just looking at the trend of this chart, our exponential growth in expenditures and coupled with the fact that if you look at most quality indicators, most importantly, infant mortality, we're not even in the top 10. So our expenditures are increasing, but there is no indication that the quality of care that we provide compared to other countries is even comparable. So why are we doing this? Why is it happening? Is it actually that we're providing good care, or is it that we are providing inefficient care and we can do a better job? And is our current reimbursement system not perpetuating an idea that would further along that idea or that change. Another thing that we need to keep in mind, two, two very big concepts, is that um, baby boomers, including my parents, are about to go into the system. They've worked very, very long to get to this place. She has worked very, very long to be able to have Medicare as something that she deserves to have. But the growth in the population of Medicare enrollees, almost a 22% of what our population is. How are we going to now? pay for the number of people entering our market. And then the third very important thing is that looking at our medical school system and looking at the training that we have in the country as present, there is going to be a severe shortage of primary care physicians. They estimate it could even be up to 20,000 to 55. And it's, it's huge because a lot of the ways that we go into medical school is to specialize. But right now we need primary care physicians and we need to encourage that. So. Let's look at the big picture, not enough doctors, much more people, and inefficient systems. How do we, we can't say we, we, we continue to do the same thing because it's just not working. So I think that the government and healthcare in general were realizing that and we're coming up with a system. It may not be a model that's perfect, but it's a model to start. And even though we have done, a lot of people in this room have worked very hard in this system and done a great job, unfortunately, it's not going to sustain us. So we better be on top of it so we can still control our lives, so we can still be on top of what we do and not have someone else take it. 
Okay, so going to core concepts, um, they want to provide financial incentives to broadly integrate networks and reduce the total cost of care for a defined population. Again, a defined population means even though we have many clinics that are separated, they really are, the model is for forcing you to consolidate. It really is. Um, whether we like it or not, there has to be some degree of consolidation. The question is, can we remain with some of our autonomy as physicians and as leaders, but still consolidate to make something a little bit more efficient? And that's key. Mm -hmm. It really is intended when you read the whole 654 pages of loveliness. Um, it is a physician-based model. It truly is. Um, it was geared toward that. If you read it, you can see that they're trying to push for that. So they are trying to, as usual, even in the past with other, if you were here in the 90s, I was not a part of that, but they do try and make and are still trying to make the PCP responsible for directing and coordinating the care. That has not changed. And so whether we like it or not, a lot of us that are in the primary care settings, they're looking at us to be kind of leading this. And if we take it in a way where we can say it's something actually exciting for us and, and talk about these things, we may be able to actually leverage that and do a great job. So I'm just going to talk about what I think are the four basic pillars. And I'm also going to kind of connect them to how they reinforce the basic pillars with the actual model itself. So patient-centered care, they really do want you to change from the concept of I'm going to take the patients in an office. I'm going to take the patients from a specific physician. I'm going to take patients from a specific health plan. They are forcing you to be patient-centered. Um, how do we succeed to really be patient-centered? Well, I think one of the main things is we have to make sure our success really is based on the patient perceiving that this new model is providing them benefit. Remember, this is an open model. Um, there's no gatekeeper here. They can go and leave as they please. And so that model and, and the government is forcing us to be patient-centered because they have no forced entry. They can't, you can't say you must go see this specialist. You must come see me or you're going to pay more. None of that. So it is about us making them perceive that we are the best place for them to be. So all of a sudden, engagement and stickiness and patient customer service, which is not as evolved as some fields, because they have had to be, needs to be at the forefront. So they really do need to see the physician as a partner in their care. And they really made sure to push um, some of that with looking at the attribution of beneficiaries. You know, I want to go a little bit into how beneficiaries are attributed. So if you already know about this, sorry, but it really is based on the plurality of care delivered. And if you think about it, attribution is done in a stepwise fashion. They will take, and I put in the codes for attribution, but they're mostly E&M codes done in outpatient visits. They're the common codes that you bill for when you see a patient. And they assign the patient to your service. They don't give them a card saying, you've been given this ACO as your you know, place to go. They say, where do you go most, is really the simplest question. And whoever you see most that is considered a PCP, and when you say PCP, under their umbrella, that's considered a family practitioner, an internal medicine physician, a geriatrician, it can also be a PA, a nurse practitioner, or a clinical nurse specialist. So if there is somebody that you see the most, that is who is going to be attributed that member. You cannot go and say, I'm going to grab this population. It just doesn't work. It really is dependent on if you see them. If you don't see them, they will no longer be attributed to you. And this attribution is very, very fluid. It, you get every quarter, you get new attribution lists. So a patient that you could have had last quarter, you don't have this quarter. And all of a sudden, you don't, you cannot say, you cannot give a provider a list of their patients because it continues, it's a moving target. So it forces you to truly change your operations, which you can talk about, to be patient-centered. And we have not done that in the past. It is something very new to us. And how do we change our mindset to do that? Now, the one caveat to this is if they are not seeing a PCP, and this is why it's stepwise, they are assigned to a specialist. A specialist, say even a cardiologist who sees them very often, if it's somebody with end-stage heart failure that sees their cardiologist every month, they will be assigned to them. So specialists are brought into this pool and are assigned to an ACO in that way. 
Now, I hope and foresee that that will change because I feel that does define the market a little bit too concretely to allow them to be able to go to different ACOs. And since there are some specialties that are limited in every geographic area, it would be that's one of, I feel, a problem. But specialists are then involved at that point. But if they're seeing a PCP, then they will not be assigned to that specialist. So the majority of people hopefully will be assigned to a PCP. Um, the other thing is if you do do some research on trends, oddly enough, Medicare patients, especially the snowbirds, they almost have a half and half attribution. They may see a PCP up north and they come down here. So it becomes really difficult actually to be able to coordinate their care because they're seeing more than one primary care physician. And it's actually more of the trend that they see more primary, uh, a array of primary care physicians than one, believe it or not. So the last point I'd like to make about patient-centered care and how they make sure the attribution follows that concept is at the end of the year, you get a final beneficiary attribution that's reconciled. And the delta on that is actually can be huge, up to 20 to 40%. So you may not even know some of your attributed beneficiaries until the end of the year. And this is why the fluidity of that and the moving target is something to discuss. So, excuse me. Okay, so the next pillar is being quality focused. And I know there is a lot of discussion we're having nowadays about quality. We have disease management programs. We're talking about, you know, making sure they come to their visits. Thank you so much. Um, but really, quality is the only concept and the only thing I want to discuss is quality is really, we've noticed, in the eye of the beholder. And what you feel is quality versus what a patient feels is quality is so different. So it's really something where you have to say, what is the perception of my patient? I am in a market, whether I like it or not, that's customer service oriented. As physicians, sometimes we get a little overwhelmed and we want to basically do evidence-based medicine. And my husband and I, we talk about this all the time. He says, I'm a great doctor, I'm a great cardiologist, and I practice evidence-based medicine. But I'm like, well, if you walk in and you don't talk kindly to that patient, you are not going to get good quality scores. It's just a fact. So, And that has also been included in the measures, in the domains. I'm glad he's not here. He'd probably be mad when uh, <laughs> I used him as an example. But um, so just going to the 33 measures, the good news is they had 65 measures. They actually dropped it by half, thank God. So you have 33 measures every year, uh, every performance year that you have to qualify for. And the interesting thing is if you do track one, so just going a little bit back, back to the basics, there is track one and track two. So track one, you share savings, there's no losses. You can only do that for the first contract period. Then you, if you want to elect to continue for the three years after that, then you have to go to a track two model. A track two model means that you have to share in losses. So eventually you will be taking some risk in this model. Um, you can start without risk though, to be more comfortable if you need it, if that's where you're at. Um, every performance year you do have to fulfill these measures, but the first performance year you actually just have to report these measures. So you get a little bit of lag time to get your feet wet, to figure out how you're going to do this, what is the best way. The other thing that's very important, and it was actually um, published in the last fee schedule, is that we all have to do PQRS if we're a physician and in a clinic. Um, in 2015, anyone with more than 100 physicians will have their reimbursement of affected almost, it could be by 2.5 percent um, if you don't do PQRS, and by 2017 it's everybody. With this, you also qualify and do your PQRS, so you're doing two things in one, which is nice. Um, so you can do both those things, and that your quality score from this will will stick, so you, can, you don't have to do both. Um, so basically the domains are patient experience, um, they have surveys and they use CAP scores. The first year, they do the CAP survey for you, and then after that, you're responsible for picking one of their vendors that are approved to do your CAP surveys. Go ahead. No. Is that similar to the age caps of the hospital? It is very similar. It is very similar. It's a little bit reoriented for the outpatient world, but very similar. Um, and Hopefully they'll give you this, but I kind of gave a breakdown. All the domains, there's four main domains, and they really have the weight that's very equal. So again, patient experience is just as important as preventative health. 
Um, the care coordination and patient safety is also very important. And again, having an EHR is double weighted. So hopefully you get this and you can look at this. Everything has an equal weight, but it is four main domains. And the at-risk population, there's 12 measures, but they do focus on the chronic care conditions, mostly ischemic vascular disease, diabetes, and coronary artery disease. So nothing new that we haven't seen. Um, things that we do every day in and out. I really think that the quality focus, it does require leadership because as you know, we're gonna have different specialties and they're all used to a different level of autonomy. And we can use the word ego sometimes, but really they are used to a different level of autonomy and they've had a history of five to 10 years of doing things the way, the way they wanna do it. And then saying that you need to talk to me before you do that requires really strong leadership because they really do need to feel that this is a fight that we're in together. If we're doing it separately, it's just not gonna work. And the third pillar is just being truly value driven. And when I mean value, I say you have to examine your current processes and take the time and say, I'm going to have to focus on eliminating waste. What's wasteful? They're services that don't ultimately contribute to outcomes. And it's one of the reasons why I think physicians are very important to this, even if they don't want to be, uh, they want to be part of the process only a little bit. Who can really tell you what contributes to outcomes when it comes to patients? It's physicians. Um, it's not something we can do kind of cookie cutter. Um, so that makes them very key. And the cost benchmark, which we'll talk about very um, kind of briefly, does involve that type of value. So they really do take, basically when I say a defined population, to give you a little bit of an idea of the cost benchmark, if you have 6,000 attributed patients to your panel, they will take those patients and they will go back three years and they'll take your Part A and Part B fee-for-service claims and then they will take from year one, which is the third year, they'll take 10%. From year two, they'll take 30% and the year right before, they'll take 60%. And they will do um, their math to give you a benchmark of what they feel is the per capita cost of the patient population you have. So if they tell you that your per capita cost is 8,000, really your goal is to m have a per capita cost less than that, so you share money. But if you don't fulfill your quality standards, it doesn't matter because then you don't get anything. So it's, it has to come together. You have to fulfill your quality pool because if we don't do 100% of our quality reporting, that 50% we have will then jump down to 30%. And then you'll get 30% of whatever you save. So that's how the math kind of works out. And they do define risk categories. So they define it in what we've known as ESRD, disabled, dual eligible, and non-dual eligible because they do have different practice patterns. And expenditures are adjusted for severity and case mix using the HCC scores that we know from MRA if anyone's done managed care in the past. So that is, uh, that is maintained here. The one interesting thing is that when they assign a population to you, they will use the HCC score. But if someone's continuously assigned to you, as you continue to adjust, they will actually look at your HCC score and your risk demographic. And whatever is lower, which what do we think is going to be lower, is what they take. So that's, it's, it's an interesting caveat. And the last thing, and I think the most important thing, is collaboration and innovation. So you really have to move away from episodic care to population health. The only way to really do that is to start looking at a whole and making data sharing and programs, which you, I won't go into because he's going to, to be able to do that. Registries, a lot of things that make it easier for you to look at a big picture even though you're sitting in front of one person. It's very hard when you're in the room to be able to have that perspective unless you have the tools to do so. So doing that and having data to share in a meaningful way is important. I bolded cultural change because this is truly, more importantly, psychologically and culturally, a big change. And doing and impacting that is probably the most difficult thing. You can have all the right tools in place in lots of different systems, but if, if there is no mindset to say, I'm going to do this, they all it's a moot point. It doesn't work. Um, and then looking at a financial model that's viable when there is a lot of upfront capital costs that maybe you even can't anticipate when you do your financial modeling. There is a tremendous degree. And I think that's why hospitals are, are kind of a logical choice because they have that ability to give you those capital costs. But I feel that there's many other systems you can look to, maybe logical, but may not be good for your values. It depends on what you're looking to do because they have their own stuff going on. 
So just to summarize, I think this model, as it evolves, will only be as good as the leaders and those who take control of the governance, the decision making, and the ability to allow providers within that ACO to actively participate towards a common goal. If you're telling somebody, it's just not going to work, because that's not how this model works. It really is too complex to have that be what you do. And if you're thinking about joining, if you're really thinking about this this year, um, just conduct your proper due diligence before joining, because when you join, you have to participate, to participate. You have to be active. So that would be my recommendation to any of the office managers or physicians that are here today. And regardless if we want it or not, the patient must always come first for quality and customer service in any type of ACO model. So even if you're in a rural health clinic, if you're here, if you're in another market, that's one thing I think that's fixed. A lot of the other things will, will be adjusted dependent on the market you're in. Now I'll go very quickly into our own ACO. So we were one of the nine awarded um, ACOs in Central Florida in July of 2012. We have um, chosen to work with Medicare and do what we have just talked about in five key areas of care. So patient caregiver ex experience, safety, preventative health care, coordination, and frail elderly health. So our network is growing, but it began and it works with our one of our largest groups and main participant is Family Physicians Group. It's been here for 25 years. Um, it's largely primary care based. There's um, 25 clinics. We do have specialties as well, including cardiology, nephrology, podiatry, um, endocrinology, and we are now certifying our palliative care program and doing consults, we're going to be doing consults for that. We also work with a hospice group called Physicians Hospice Partners. I work there as well. <laughs> so um, we actually have hospice in the eight major hospitals here, including Florida and Orlando Health. So. Um, FIFM, which is a primary care group in Pinellas County, um, Gastroenterology Associates of Osceola, um, Medical and Geriatric Associates, which is, um, if you know Dr. Sabrino, his group, Cardiovascular Centers, Central Florida Kidney Centers, Cardiovascular Associates, and Pulmonary Ganesha Kula. And our goals are really truly to remain the cutting edge and leaders in evolving healthcare. So that's really what we're trying to do. We've done it in the past. We want to be able to anticipate and do, from a clinic model perspective, very specifically, to remain on edge and do things that are very, per very collaborative, innovative, and productive. We want to deliver high quality coordinated care to Medicare, and we want to also look at other payers, including Medicaid and Medicare with Supplement, which we've worked for in the past and is our main source of what we, we actually work with now. We want to create a patient-centered organization. We're already a patient-centered medical home, home NCQA certified, um, level three, and we want to control the health care costs that are growing tremendously in, our, in, every, in every city, basically. What's our toolbox? What makes us different? So we already have a medical economics department. So we have a actual department that is focused on providing clinical and financial analytics so we can track appropriate use of healthcare resources. That, apartment, that uh, department has grown and has been there for at least the last 10 years and is something we use on a daily basis. We do quality and utilization management. So we have a quality director. We also do scorecards for all of our physicians and we use our EHR to give quality scores to our physicians so that they can see not only how they're doing within their own patient population, but how they're doing compared to the other physicians. Uh, our utilization management, we have utilization managers to make sure that we are appropriately sending our patients to get appropriate care, but also at the best place that's not as expensive. If it's apples to apples and something's cheaper, we want them to go there because we want to make sure that everything is used appropriately and efficiently. We know that there's a pie and you know there's no way the pie is going to grow. Operation support is very, very vital and it grows. And as we were talking about, our growth in operations is constantly evolving. And I think information technology is where it becomes very key. Very key. Um, and a lot of places, such as pharmacies that work at, look at workflows, I think healthcare is the next place where we are really going to start looking at office workflow. And it's going to be a lot of case studies of how to improve your office workflow so you can get the most out of your day. And our IT guidance is, is very key. Our informatics department is growing exponentially, not only to support our own staff, but to support our participants and whoever decides to join our group. Compliance guidance, we actually now have an, a growing compliance department, and that's going to grow even further. As you work with the federal government, you want to make sure that you're always 
<laughs> doing the right thing. I can. I don't want to go into that area. So we make sure that our regulations are on task. Also, there's a lot of different. We all are kind of. Um, familiar with some of the legal laws, but there are a few nuances that are within the Affordable Care Act that allow us to use some of the waivers and things like that to help us serve our patients if it's appropriate for their care and will improve what um, the, any of the medical conditions they have. So it's important though that we fall into the legalities of that. All right. I'm going to move it on to Dr. Moidu. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. So Anjali. It was a uh, 101 on ACOs, and having said that, I, I have a tough act to follow. Just giving you the fundamentals. Now I'm going to try to be as brief as possible, but I am very excited. As you heard in my introduction, I've been a professor. So saying that I've been a professor, I love this board and I like to be more interactive. But before I get into the thing, I want to know my audience. Could you, how many of you are physicians here? So we have a few experience. Good. Uh, I should raise my hand. <laughs> and how many of you represent a physician office? That's a lot more. And how many of you come from the healthcare industry? How many of you come from information technology? It seems like it's an information technology session, but unfortunately, I'm not going to give you a very long story because I'm going to get up. And can I, you got one for me? I, I think I can hold a class this big. I, I used to be a professor at Purdue, and my class was 125 people. A lot longer and behind, I couldn't even see the people. Uh, they had the bleeding rafters up there. So when, we, when I was asked to speak here, I said, we would like to give the 101 I'd like Dr. Anjali to do, because she has really done her homework. Until recently, I was in another organization, and when I joined FPG, I was very lucky to be there because they had a great groundwork all in place. So, uh -oh, I've been going forward without telling you the story. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, while I'm still getting it back, let me say the EMR utilization, which is a fundamental, is 100% at uh, FPG. <coughs> All doctors use it. And if you say EMRs, yes, as Dr. Anjali said, we have to improve. But I decided I'll talk about the, am I going the wrong way? Yeah, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. <laughs> All right. So we chose the three topics to share with you from an IT perspective, because everybody knows about the EMR. In terms of the HIE, the Health Information Exchange, we have our own, and we are also working with the others in the market. So the others in the market include the two major hospitals, or I should say three, because we also have Osceola Regional. And then we are looking at what UCF brings to the market. And we are also observing what Central Florida Rio does. At this moment and at this stage of our ACO, we are rather looking internally, and that's our challenge. The three topics are the core subjects that Dr. Anjali brought out. Patient management. You are assigned a list of people. It's not the annual uh, selection that the insurance companies do enrollment and give you your people. This is 24-7, 365 open enrollment. <coughs> We need to, we get a list of people. The list doesn't match each time. We need to submit their preferences on data sharing every month. And all those complexities require a beneficiary list management solution. When we looked at the vendors, nobody knows the game. So it had to be built specifically for us. And one of the members of Morof was part of that experience and walked the walk with us. And that's one piece. Analytics, as Dr. Anjali shared with you, we have a very strong medical economics team, right? What, does, what do they do? They already knew how to handle the data. The thing was, how do we bring that data into regular work? How do we make it accessible at the point of care? And that's something you'll see. 
uh, patient engagement. Patient is king. Change has to come. Where do we begin? At the point of patience. And that's the reason we went there. So this is the beneficiary list management. And when we look at it, these may be very small here, but hopefully a little bigger there. But we get very rudimentary data from the CMS. We then have to check within our records who we, this person is, where do they live, and you know the number that they peg everybody on is called the Hicken, and that Hicken number can change. Imagine your social security chain. It's it's a very big challenge for us. So we need to be able to track the people, and then we went and got this solution made. And this solution allows you to do the regular login, search the patient, track the patients. And this is being happening over 26 of our clinics in real time. And our affiliates also have access to this. This is, we have kept it outside the EMR with a specific reason we, need, we don't have the same things happening all through forever. The situation could change. This list is managed. And then every month, we need to export it in an XML with a certain structure the government wants. And then this is the government website. We got to go and load it up. Lot, every 30th, my colleague here, Amar Balsara, gets at 5 o'clock, starts getting my pin pricks. Hey, have we submitted? Have we submitted? <laughs> because it's keeping on track. And the same thing is expected on every other situation we have. Now that I've shared the first pain point and how it was solved with the local company, let me share the next piece. The gaps in care. This is the aggregation of the work of 10 years, and now we have taken it to the next level. It's on the fingertips, on demand. I can only say lots of organizations have that data, but our team here, and we have a fairly large group of for FPG support in India that have together put this for us in just four months. So I want to tell you, delivery is possible if there is a will. And most importantly, the support of the leadership. The dedication and attribution of resources is critical. So if any organization wants to jump into the ACO game, the due diligence begins by souls searching internally, do I want to do it? It is not just because you enroll, you'll get these 60 people from the insurance assigned to you, that you'll get money. You have to perform. And this is one of those big challenges. Not only we track these problems list, the meds, the salient features that we call on the flow sheet, the immunizations, but we also look at the MRA scores, so we know exactly where the patient is, what needs to be intervened upon, and get them to that service delivery in time. Sometimes, and that's where the waivers and security in the law becomes a big issue, is you need to be legal when you allow them to come to you because you need to give them the service. But within the guidelines CMS has framed for you, or the law has framed for you. So legal insights are very critical as uh, she had them as a referee. I would say the zebra uniform doesn't look good. <laughs> So we need to stay out of that problem. Uh, the last piece, and as I said, I'll be very brief, is the patient engagement. When we check in our patients, we want them to know they are welcome. We want them to validate their information. We give an English and a Spanish solution. Again, that's a local company. And we have this given. We have started at Kissimmee, where we have a large Hispanic population. So the Spanish language issue was a big issue. We could get it done. And in the process, I hope you can read it, that the gaps in care are engaged with the conversation with the patient. So the patient knows that they need a mammogram and would they like it done now. So when they go to the physician, that can be part of the conversation. Preventive care, as Dr. Anjali said, is very critical. The other piece which very many physicians like is the medications. We prescribe, 
But when did they fill in? How long have they been in on the medication before we see them again? Is it very critical in our decision making? And not only do we know from our EMR when there was a refill submitted or request or prescription prescribed, but we also know what were the next steps. When did the patient fulfill it? I could have prescribed it on 22nd of January, but the patient doesn't fulfill it till 25th of February, and I see the patient on 28th. What expectation should I have of the impact of the medication? Sure. So these are the parts that are, we are pulling together, and that is being part of our conversation, including allowing them to say, I could not afford it. There are resources available, but to make those resources right, we need that information. So patient is now a partner. Now, giving this technology out is not the only big thing. We want to track the technology as being usable, and we are mon monitoring its acceptance. So this is, for each doctor, we know who, how many patients were there. And on this right side, you see very clearly the time they took. That time is very critical. If the patients are having struggle, we need to be able to go and help them. And this is a summary of, I jumped one. Uh, there's a summary right here at the bottom, which tells us how many patients at that clinic were avail eligible, how many did use the service, what percentage were good. And this is the last piece, which I really I haven't, uh, there are more screenings that we do, but depression and smoking are the ones we started with. So who is eligible? Should we? Bring that in. Should we start screening them for it? Smoking is the other. And here it tells us that we had two patients we could have done a depression screening on. And this is actual data from yesterday. And one of the reasons we believe this is critical is that's the way we can be proactive. Eric, you're going to lead off this part of the uh, presentation. Very good. Please do. All right, um, it, I know we're running short on time. Uh, I think we're, we're running up close to nine o'clock now. Um, so. and, and actually, folks, we knew that we might run a little bit, so if you have to leave today, please leave as quietly as you can, but our presentation today will probably go to about 9, 10, 9, 15. We don't want to rush you, Eric. You've got some important information, and I think you're going to show pros and cons and, and talk more about that. Hopefully. Thank you, Eric. Hopefully. Okay, so um, it, that was a great uh, explanation of the accountable care organizations. Um, I I think that it's a very complex issue, probably one that we can't cover in an hour. Um, but I encourage everyone in the audience, if they've got questions, uh, I think all of us are available uh, via email, telephone, whatever, if you want to expand upon this. Um, accountable care really comes down to, uh, just like the doctor said, it, it's, it's a patient-centered approach. And as a physician or an office manager, you're, you're asking yourself, is it right for me? Is it right for my practice? Is it right for my patients? And I think that um, that answer is complex, too. Um, the ACO basics, uh, how many are there today? There's 253 approved ACOs in the last 14 months. Uh, there's 400 in the application process. This is a, this is a race to the finish. Um, there's two types of risk models, which uh, that alludes to the tracks that she was discussing earlier, track one and track two. The, the one-sided risk model is a 50-50 split. If there is shared savings, if you're able to generate savings for CMS, they will split that savings with you 50-50. And then it, that money goes back to the ACO to distribute to their members as they see fit. And I'm assuming that every physician inside of the network uh, will have their individual scorecards and their contributions will be paid out in that way. Um, the two-sided risk model is a 60-40 split, 60% 60 going back to the ACO. Um, but it, there's there's a additional risk to that because if there are losses, if the, you do not meet your benchmarks, you are on the hook for that loss. And so it, that derivative of the, of the loss spread back out to the physicians. Uh, it, it is a, a riskier model. Um, but as she said, the, every ACO out there has to transition by year three, after year three. They have to transition to a two-sided risk model. Okay. Uh, ACO is just a new acronym for some of the models that have been out there before, the HMOs, the MSOs, the IPAs. Uh, it's just a, another way to 
to consolidate. It's all about scale. It's all about leverage. Um, ACOs are different in the sense that they do not have some of the same legal restrictions that the models have had in the past. Uh, the Department of Justice has advised that ACOs are free from star clause. That's a big one. Uh, free from anti-kickback laws. Free from self-referral laws. Uh, these are all game changers uh, because it, it really takes the gloves off. Um, it allows an ACO to practice in a in a format and in a on a landscape that kind of levels the playing field a little bit. Um, the Supreme Court, all, obviously everyone knows that the Supreme Court ruled the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, is the law of the land for now. Um, I think that, that it is probably going to continue to change. Um, I think that we are, we are just on the cusp of, of what's to come. And like I said, it, it, no matter what acronym you put on it, um, HMOs, MSOs, IPAs, ACOs, it's all about leverage. It's all about the balance of power. And it's the independent physician, the solo practitioner, um, the solo provider has a hard time competing in this arena because they, they simply don't have the scale and the, the ability to touch member lives. And that's what it all boils down to. The more member lives that a physician touches or has access to, uh, garners them more leverage with the, the carriers, which equates to better reimbursement rates for them. Um, the typical solo practitioner will negotiate a rate of 80% of Medicare rates. Uh, Medicare should be your baseline. You should never go below it. Everyone knows that. But it's difficult as an independent physician to, to negotiate those types of rates. If you band together, collectively, we all recognize that we're worth more than we are as individuals, which will garner you um, leverage, again, uh, with the insurance carriers. And typically, you'll negotiate rates north of 150% of Medicare. Um, so it, it is it is scale. It is it is about leverage and adding scale. The historical mix of ownership so far um, of the 253, 67% are owned by physicians, single provider physicians. 19% um, multiple providers, 8% insurance owned, 6% insurance provider mix. It's a hybrid. Uh, that is that's changing. Um, the trending right now is that hospital and carrier ACO participation is growing quickly. Uh, 15 hospitals in Vermont just joined forces. Two hospitals in Utah control 85% of all healthcare providers in that state. Uh, <laughs> that's where it's headed, folks. Um, ORMC recently purchased a local ACO for $50 million. Um, it, was a, it was a band of physicians, a local group, they had been in business, they had been a, uh, an MSO model uh, for several years. So they already had a distribution channel. Uh, they became an ACO in April. They sold in September for $50 million. Um, and it's, it's all about the distribution channel. It's all about access. Uh, so United Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, and Cigna, they've launched their own ACO models. Retailers are getting in on it too. Walmart, Walgreens, they're getting serious about the business of healthcare delivery, and it is a business. Why were ACOs created? Uh, they tell us quality versus quantity, which is absolutely the way it should be. Is it really a patient-centered approach? It has to be in this setting because the patient is the driver. They were talking about the patient is the driver because that particular patient can reside in multiple ACOs based on utilization. That's measured every quarter. All right, fee-for-service, everyone's familiar with fee-for-service. The ACO model is fee-for-service plus shared savings minus the shared loss, in my opinion, equals risk to the patient, I mean the, the physician. Uh, this is all about cost containment. The current system is unsustainable. The current path is unsustainable. Uh, Congress has not acted to, to mm -hmm. fix the SGR situation. There is no doc fix. They continue to push down the road. This, the ACO model bridges the gap on cost containment while making it the physician's choice to participate or not. Uh, so it really comes down to what their, what their three to five year plan is, what is their, where are they at on the bell curve of their career path, what is their ex exit strategy, whether or not they should participate. 
obstacles. Um, she mentioned the budget, the, the Im immense amount of capital that would be required to set up the system to start. Uh, CMS estimates the investment of $1.7 million for an ACO just to build the infrastructure necessary to support it. Um, independent studies suggest that, that number is too low. It's typically $5.7 to $12 million. Your bandwidth, your management team, your existing management team, do you, do you have enough breadth inside of your or bench strength to deal with all of these complex issues? Um, is your office manager your existing office manager at one location going to be able to handle 50, 70, 500 disparate physicians and providers across your network. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a major investment to bring somebody in. Uh, competition and time. Uh, like I said, this is a race. Um, whoever gets there first is probably going to garner the market share. Um, and compliance. Uh, mentioned the legal aspects of it and it is they continue to layer on additional administrative burdens and requirements upon the the medical industry and it if you cannot stay on top of that you're in you're in trouble um, and then of course your success is going to depend on physician buy-in uh, provider buy-in inside of your network are they all going to be able to play together nicely in the sandbox um, continue to uh, push forward with the objectives of the, the company. Now, is shared savings sustainable? In my opinion, no. Um, I, think the, I think you need to develop alternate revenue streams in order to maintain the ACO's viability, to keep providers motivated and moving in the right direction. Uh, the promise of shared savings maybe, hopefully, if we do things right, years two and three, is, is difficult to sell to a physician or a provider, uh, licensed professional over time because the, where we've been for the last several decades is a fee-for-service model. The more patients I see, the more money I make. The more procedures I do, the more money I make. Now you're telling me, I, which I agree, is, is it should be a patient-centered approach. I'm, I'm interested in the long-term health of that patient, but if, if I need to do less procedures and I need to order less tests, I'm gonna make less money. So how do, you, how do you, as an ACO, how do you bridge that gap? How do you promise future revenue streams and tell them to do less? I think you, you have the opportunity to do that. You, the biggest asset of an ACO is not the, their member base, their, um, their patients. The biggest asset is their distribution channel. And if you can create other creative solutions to provide alternate revenue streams, to augment the, the, the subsequent loss of that fee-for-service revenue, you can keep providers happier and moving forward longer. Um, it, trying to keep 500 or 5,000 physicians happy uh, in, a, in a setting is difficult. Um, and and trying, to find, trying to find a balance that makes sense not only for the physician base, but also the, the patients. It, it, is, it is going to take creative solutions, and, and I think Dr. Villas is absolutely right. It, it, we, are, we are just starting, and the rules are going to change again. Um, but I think if you walk into it understanding and knowing that you have to have shared, shared savings is not enough. You have to have other alternate revenue streams. That's where some of you in the audience will probably come in. If you're, if you're marketing or selling to uh, physicians and ACOs, you need to be able to come to the table with solutions that allow them to layer in additional revenue streams and, and I'll give you some examples forgive all the acronyms there just wasn't enough room on this slide uh, you see see the ACO is in the center and just going clockwise uh, GPO is a group group purchasing organization uh, think about your leverage buying power as a group of physicians if you have five five hundred physicians across your network, you're more geographically diverse, uh, you, you garner more leverage, you have more buying power. It's just economies of scale. Uh, the CRM is customer relations management. And what Dr. Vias touched on earlier was making sure that that patient stays happy and is, is well cared for and maintains inside of your network because 
you have no control. If that if that patient goes to another physician and, and is you their utilization is higher in that quarter for another physician, they, they migrate outside of your ACO. So you have to in order to keep them in your in your ACO, you want to keep them happy. And uh, there are solutions out there. There are vendors out there that can help you with that. Uh, the healthcare HIE healthcare information exchange. It, it, there has to be a repository of data uh, that basically CMS will feed you back your historical claims data on a quarterly basis. Uh, so you've got to have a place to put all that data and push it up against your actual results. Um, and now think about this, you're, you're talking about working from multiple disparate systems. Not every physician inside of your network is going to be on the same billing platform, operations platform, so they're disparate systems. Now you have to get all that data from some of these HL7 protocols that could be a black box and you have to put them in a, in a repository and you have to push that against the the CMS actual data to see, to benchmark yourself, to see if you're on target or not. Um, BCA, what was that? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the billing and collections agency. If you, you could start as a physician inside of your ACO. You could you could actually start another company as a billing and collections agency and and market that out to your your existing members inside of your group. Um, it's always going to be you're always going to garner more attention from a, a patient that hasn't paid their bill if it's from a third party instead of you, the physician, because their priority to pay their bills. You are last on the list. I promise you. Um, so if it comes from a third party, it's better, and that's another uh, alternative revenue stream for the for the ACO. Um, and the PIP is the patient information portal. Giving the patient access to their data is one of the requirements inside of the ACO. Um, but building your own is probably a good idea, smart, and only not only for your market, but you could actually package that and resell it to other markets, to other ACOs. All right, is an ACO right for my practice? It's complicated. Um, it, it, it is a very complex issue, and it is, is dependent upon where you're at in your career cycle. Uh, it depends on what your exit strategy is and what your, your long and short-term goals are. My advice is, is if you're going to go down this road, which a lot of people are going to explore, my advice is to seek the, seek the help of a professional that can, can really understand your goals so that they can give you the best direction. And that's it for me. Thank you. And now, Ken, with the Health Council, I know you've got all kinds of statistics running up inside your head, and I know you're going to get them to us for posting on our open LinkedIn page. So please, Ken Peach. I've, I've uh, condensed my uh, presentation here to maybe basically three points in the interest of time this morning, so the rest of it will come out through the, uh, through the email to the website. First of all, I have to confess I'm a recovering hospital administrator. <laughs> and um, I, I say recovering because I spent the last four or five years working with a physician group in Seminole County and then had a chance to see from the other side, sold health insurance, ran a health insurance agency, and realized, you know, that where I spent 15, 20 years putting heads in beds, the whole goal right now is to keep them out. But the tendency of the hospitals is to think, okay, we know how to do this. Who did the government look to to find out when they were dreaming up accountable care organizations? They looked at Kaiser, the Intermountain Healthcare. They looked at uh, Guy Singer. They, and lo and behold, you know, they thought, well, these are wonderful hospital systems that have figured this out. But think back, where did those hospital systems come from? Those were physician groups before they ever became hospitals. So the tendency is to think, because we're hospitals, this is what we want to move into. If you look at the bond rating rankings now on many hospitals around the country, they're hurting because they bought so many physicians that it takes time for them to turn those financial investments around, and it's actually hurting their bottom line. So what we're seeing is an expansion. I said two, three years ago, and talking to someone at United Healthcare, it's going to be the physicians that are going to drive this. And Lo and behold, where are we? So we're now recognizing that. But guess who else is coming to the table? Eric mentioned Walgreens. Uh, three of the last ACOs that were just announced are Walgreens initiatives, Walgreens well um, networks. Um, in addition to that, what we're seeing, some really interesting approaches here. Um, we're seeing uh, Aetna, 
uh, get into helping on the backside. We'll work with a large physician group, we'll work with a hospital, and we'll help you put in place the systems necessary to support this. We're seeing that with United, with AVMED coming to the table. You may have seen in Volusia County in just the past two weeks, uh, Health First Health Plan out of Brevard, very successful integrated model in, of care in Brevard County, now hooking up with Florida Hospital to put health systems in place, to take their knowledge from a health plan standpoint, and incidentally in Brevard County, their new CEO has made a decision that their health plan will be the entity moving forward, and they happen to own hospitals, and they happen to own physician practices. So their whole focus is changing to one of the ability to manage risk, which is where FPG is such a great example because they've been doing that for years. So those groups that are really into the risk management side, the capitated mm -hmm. uh, contracting with uh, Medicare Advantage, those are the, the smart movers are moving very rapidly into this environment because they can, they have that knowledge. Some other areas that we're seeing, we've seen the movement of hospitals to acquire that ability, the movement with uh, physician of, uh, associates, the Cigna Collaborative ACO um, in this market. Now we're seeing Medicaid ACOs forming in Utah, Colorado, Minnesota, and Oregon. And we're beginning to see some really unique specialty ACOs. Uh, first one you may have heard of is right here in Florida, in South Florida, Florida Blue, getting together with Baptist Hospital South Florida and advanced medical specialties, an oncology group there, to basically develop an accountable care organization around a particular specialty disease. Now, if you ask Nate Kaufman, some of you may be familiar, he's, a, um, he's been on the American College of Healthcare Executives faculty for years. He says, if we're gonna reduce the cost of healthcare, someone has to get paid less. I thought that was pretty good. Um, there are better approaches, he says, than Medicare ACOs to deliver accountable care. Best place to start for a company is an accountable care organization for its own employees that's not hampered by all the CMS accountable care uh, regulations and restrictions. We've heard it this morning. God bless FPG because you're taking the tough part first. And I believe there's probably an opportunity to look at commercial. We actually talked about this two, three years ago in Seminole County about testing the waters on the commercial side because the other thing is you're dealing with a senior population. That's where your utilization is going to go high. If you begin to look instead at the employer population, you have the ability to do some really unique things. Um, yesterday, a report released by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement in, in um, Boston, basically using the hypothetical, this is actually a case they changed the name to George. George doesn't like to be hospitalized. He doesn't like to go to the emergency department. Who does? He wants to live alone with his cats. Um, he likes to be able to get around his apartment and move outside if he can. He wants privacy and respect from his caregivers and providers. And he wants to be in touch with his daughters more frequently. Well, the system barriers is that every time the assistants came in, quite often they were rather abrupt with him. Uh, he'd not been able to get the appropriate wheelchair to keep, maintain his mobility, and his care providers don't talk to one another. So what did the system do there? They looked with permission to go through his cupboards and refrigerator to assess daily diet habits, to find out what is he eating and how can we change that, to go grocery shopping with him, teach him about sodium and fluid retention for his CHF, and connect to his desire to stay out of the hospital, to work with him on uh, visiting providers so that they know to make sure they call prior, let them know that they're coming so he, they just don't show up, to work with his health plan and his DME provider to replace his broken wheelchair so he can get out, and to teach him how to use Facebook to connect with his daughters. Now, most of that, just as we saw happening with the AICU in Atlantic City, which is a model that the casinos and the uh, providers up there got together, they realized that really, if we can make a difference, quite often it's not a medical difference at all. What we've talked about so far today has really been focused on the medical solution. We've got to do, as the Prevention Institute recommends, take two steps back. Let's look at the root causes of what is ending up with these patients that have to be managed by FPG, and let's go back and begin to make a difference there so that we can impact this down the road. So um, I think, you know, as an example of that, or as, as these things move forward, we're also going to see a significant indication of new technologies also playing into this. I met yesterday with a Meritor. 24-7 doctor contact. Just pick up your phone, go online, video face-to-face -face, or email a physician and do a consult wherever you are at any time of the day or night. Uh, no closing down hours, no limited hours as in an urgent care or a retail health clinic or a physician's practice. So, you know, the new technology is out there and moving very, very rapidly. So as we, as I kind of wrap up here, let me also share, I was asked to mention for the vendors in the room. We didn't get to show any vendors in the room before I even go here. Okay. 
what's this going to do to you? Because many of you have been dealing one-on-one -on -one with individual physician practices. Now, all of a sudden, they're rolling up into these larger business organizations. Tendency is for larger business organizations to become more sophisticated in their buying, and I don't say that in a negative sense, but it's just that they're now buying for a large group of physicians and operations as opposed to individuals. It's going to be tougher. Um, the Health Council, we just announced an, a link to Premier um, GPO, and we're now allowing hospitals, or, or rather physicians, nursing homes, and a variety of other providers throughout the country, uh, imaging centers, surgery centers, to buy at a up to 15% less from the same suppliers that they were paying yesterday. They'll be paying less tomorrow. Um, that's just the nature of it, and we're rolling it out across the state. So I think you have to look at these things and say, where are the opportunities to look at accountable care going forward, an exciting thing to look at, but look at all the variations and, and approaches, not just the Medicare approach. There may be other opportunities for you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. We've just got a few moments. I'm going to allow one or two questions of our great panelists. Wendy, you want to start off with one? Just let me get the microphone so people can all hear your question. Um, Ken, you just brought up, and so did you, Eric, about GPOs. And we find in our business we're going directly to the, like, Adventist Health and that kind of thing and creating contracts versus the GPO because it seems like GPO is really – doing well for the GPO, not necessarily for the hospital. So I'm I'm seeing that, and I'm wondering if you're seeing a lot more people getting away from a, C, a GPO and creating what you're considering for the purchasing power. Let's look at the prime example. Our, our link is with Premier GPO, which is owned in part by Adventist Health Systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they buy, they bought last year $43 billion in services, merchandise, food, um, and as a result of that, and, and and have generally indicated a savings of up to 15% off the same supplier. So if you're now getting your medical supplies from McKesson and paying a price, tomorrow you'll pay a lower price once you get into the GPO. And it doesn't cost you anything to get into it. So, you know, we're looking, the reason we signed this agreement in December is simply, and began rolling this out through the other health councils across the state, is simply because we recognize that, uh, you know, as Nate Kaufman said, somebody has to get paid less. We'd rather have the situation where the providers keep as much as they can because they're putting millions of dollars, you know, as Dr. Vias mentioned, and, and uh, you know, they're putting millions and millions of dollars into these accountable cares to get them up and running. Does this purchasing um, at actually work and bring down those costs? More than purchasing, the issue with technology is standardization. And the foundations of standardization are not only in the technology but in the processes by which you work. As Dr. Anjali shared with us, the issue is where we will focus a lot in the future is on the workflow. Introducing the EMR to a doctor, you just converted his written habits into typing and pecking on a screen, which is not natural to them. I mean, certainly my generation grew up without those computers. And I'm among the generation that, as Dr. Anjali said, about to be a baby boomer. <laughs> Boom, I will. But I want to say, this is my conversation with doctors who are younger than me who work for FPG. The EMR as we see it today is a bad design. And here I'm going to confess to that. It's a bad design for what we have done is automated the processes of all the staff that used to help us. The x-ray film is put in the folder. The lab reports attached to the case. That is the task that we have automated. Where we have failed is in getting the thoughts of the physician into the EMR. That is not a problem if we redesign the technology. That'll take time. But in the intermediate process, we can change the workflow. How you use the technology, how you use the team. That's the strength of FPG, where they found that it slowed their physicians. We have put manpower that assists the doctor in collecting the data. So we do not use our doctors as data entry clerks. They were very expensive. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, I want to keep us going. Last uh, thoughts, Eric, uh, on the con side, he talked about standardization, technology. That has to be one of the hurdles that keeps people from maybe entering into this, yes or no? I think uh, absolutely. Um, if you've got, if you're, 
looking at an organization that has the ability, the deep pockets, the infrastructure, um, those are going to be hurdles that you will not get through on your own. And the investment is, is a very large number up front with the hopes of a payout. Um, it, and that's the, that's the real kicker here, is that you're waiting for two to three years down the road before you even see any shared savings, uh, assuming that you can track it, measure it, track it, and benchmark it, and beat it. Now, after year three, let's say you assume you're going to re-up for another three years, you have to get better year after year after year. And at what point is it a diminished return? At what point are the margins so skinny that you cannot improve? So the only way to, to improve then is to grow, to, to get more members, get more member lives, continue to grow. Um, it's, it's a slippery slope. So if, if it's something you're really considering, I would, I would really do a lot of research on the group that, you're, that you're, you're considering joining. Make sure that they have the infrastructure in place. Make sure that their culture is, is one that is, is conducive to your, the, the way you practice medicine. Thank you, Eric. And uh, Dr. Vias, you might have some closing remark. And I know we talked, of, I let it on technology. I'm just going to let but, Eric represent my thoughts now. But, 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 but tell me, it, it, it still comes down to the people, whether it's the patient, but actually those caregivers, we still have to make improvements here. We just can't throw technology at them. We still no, have to you, integrate. You can't, because if you don't integrate, and, and as I said, we're going to bring in a lot of technology. And you guys, I mean, I know, I've seen it. Everyone's coming up with really innovative things. But if the mindset is not there, and you have to bring it in there, and that's the hardest part, bringing that culture of, I want to change, and I feel like it's going to be a good thing, because there's so much uncertainty. And uncertainty, people don't like change. It, talk, stop talking about health care. Just talk about, do you like change? Do you like moving from your house to another house, even you think it's going to be a great house? No, you hate it. So you're asking people, and then you're asking people that are also, there's going to be a shortage, and you're asking a lot of guys that are at 45 to 50, you made them change to an electronic system, and now you're asking them to change again. And that is your biggest problem. Um, and, and getting through to make them be on board will be more important than anything else you do. I think the only thing that we can say that's certain is that the only thing constant is change and we yes. have to adapt. Dr. Yes. Moy, do help me wrap it up with one last minute here. The only thing I'll say is the system is going to change. In system, we have three parts. Technology, processes which get captured in software, and people. Hardware comes out from the factory working. It will one day fail. Software comes out from the factory sluggish. Over time, it works. But manware is the biggest challenge for all of us. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give it up for our panelists, Dr. Moidu, Dr. Vias, Eric Luptemeyer, Ken Peach. Thank you. It was an outstanding uh, panel discussion. For those of you, just before you leave, I'll call your attention to the fact that we do have uh, more of calendar notebooks here. You'll see that the two, the Thursday meetings are highlighted so that you don't miss a more of meeting in the future. The business after hours that we'll be holding are circled. And if you're looking for a vendor, You'll also find our membership, current membership list in there. There's many vendors that can help you, whether it be technology or other things, to accomplish your goals. I'd like uh, board members to please stand. More of board members, please stand. Be recognized for all your strong efforts in leading this group. I congratulate you on, on all your work and effort. And with that, we say thank you for attending. I hope you have a great day out there. <laughs>